still going on. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 1, to the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand. Again, the seven stars, seven angels, possibly seven pastors, but Jesus has got him. He's got him in his protective right hand. And the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, from church to church, Jesus involved in all that's going on, says this, verse 2. We look at Ephesus. I know your deeds and your toil and your perseverance and that you cannot tolerate evil men and you put to test those who call themselves apostles and they are not and you have found them to be false and you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary there's your positive affirmation that's great Ephesus you're doing an outstanding job an amazing job. We've seen the partial revelation of Jesus in this letter. The one holding on to the angels, the messengers, walking among the lampstands. By the way, the lampstand in Ephesus. <laughs> the location, again, is in the southwestern coast of Turkey. Right up where the Mediterranean Sea becomes a great inlet between Turkey and Greece. Called the Aegean Sea. Off the coast of Ephesus is the Isle of Patmos where John was exiled when he received the revelation. Now, the biblical connection to the church at Ephesus, just for a little background, Paul visited Ephesus on his second missionary journey. We know specifically, specifically of three, there were likely more, but specifically three missionary journeys mentioned in the book of Acts. On the second journey, Paul comes to Ephesus, and he planted the church there. And he left behind a couple of fantastic Bible teachers named Priscilla and Aquila. By the way, ladies, don't think that God doesn't have major plans for you. Priscilla's name comes before Aquila. Both of them great Bible teachers. So he left behind Priscilla and Aquila. And on his third mission, he comes back to Ephesus. He stayed there a full three years. And later, John the Apostle would become the pastor of the church at Ephesus. What a fantastic church. Planted by Paul, taught by Priscilla and Aquila, pastored by John. And this church had it going on. They had it down. They were persevering. They had great deeds, their toil, their efforts, and they did not tolerate evil. And Jesus says, right on, Ephesus, way to go, excellent, outstanding. But think about this. When Paul came to Ephesus, and you may want to flip in your Bibles to Acts chapter 19. When Paul came to Ephesus to plant the church, there was a small group of Christians, believers, already there. He planted with that group. However... That little group was missing something. They were missing something. Acts chapter 19, beginning in verse 1, it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the upper country and came to Ephesus and found some disciples. And he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said to him, no, well, we've not even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, well, into what then were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, well, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in him who was coming after him, that is, Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking with tongues and prophesying. And there were in all about 12 men, and there's the beginning of the church of Ephesus. Cool. These 12 guys. At its inception, the lampstand in Ephesus, though, was missing something. They were missing the Holy Spirit. They had functioned for a season, for a time, without the Holy Spirit, these 12 guys. They hadn't been walking in the Holy Spirit, only in the baptism of John. They hadn't received the Holy Spirit. They didn't have the full picture, and they didn't have the empowering of the Lord. So here they are, struggling along with no spirit. No spirit involved. Now remember this, the connection between the Spirit and the church is critical to the life of the church. A church without the Spirit is, in my mind, a dead church. And this lack, at the very beginning of the church of Ephesus, I believe, had an historical impact on the church of Ephesus over time. The fact that they did not start out with the Holy Spirit, only receiving the Holy Spirit later. Now, skipping ahead to Acts chapter 20, verse 27. Paul, in his last meeting with the elders now at the church of Ephesus, after being with them for a time, he warned them of coming dangers. Listen to his discussion with them in this passionate farewell. Verse 27. 
Paul says, I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. That word purpose is literally counsel. What does that mean? It means Paul taught him scripture. From one end of the book to the other end of the book, the whole counsel of the word of God. It's why we teach the Bible the way we do at the bridge. It's why right now we're still in the book, book of Leviticus and during Revelation. It's the whole counsel. There is not a page in the book that we should be missing. Not a verse that is not there on purpose. And so he said, I did not shrink from declaring the whole purpose of God. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Notice where he says the wolves will come from, in among you. Paul's main concern was not attacks from the outside which tend to just make churches stronger. It was wolves from the inside, which tends to tear, tear churches apart. And he says, be on guard for all the flock. Um, I know again, verse 29, after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Paul goes on and he says, therefore be on the alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. Night and day. There was a lot of Bible study, gang. Do you think they tired of it? Every time the door was open, they were there. Over and over. And, and that gives me hope because if I go on tonight, hey, you know, they had to be there night and day. <laughs> be on the alert, he says. For three years I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. Paul was passionate about this. Verse 32, And now I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or clothes. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my own needs and to the men who were with me. Paul was working on the side. He wasn't taking pay for what he was doing. In verse 35, And everything I showed you that by working hard in this manner you must help the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he himself said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and he prayed with them all. And they began to weep aloud and embraced Paul and repeatedly kissed him, grieving especially over the word which he had spoken, that they would not see his face again. And they were accompanying him to his ship. Ephesus was passionate in the beginning. They loved Paul. They loved the word. They were tearful. They embraced him. They, they loved him. And Ephesus was braced for the coming storm. Prepared ahead of time. Flip back to Revelation chapter 2. Prepared to stand against evil men who would creep up from within. Prepared to persevere for the truth. To with their deeds and their actions and their minds and their heart to stand firm for the Lord. This is what Paul braced them for and they were ready. And this is exactly how they lived. Which brings us to the second part of Jesus' letter. He gives the positive affirmation. That positive affirmation. He says, Ephesian church, you have saved the course. Verse 2. I know your deeds, your toil, your perseverance. You don't tolerate evil men. You have stayed the course. Everything Paul taught you over these, those three years and that last passionate farewell where he said, be on guard. They were. They were. They remembered everything they had been taught. They stayed the course. And furthermore, they not only stayed the course, but they stated the truth. They stood on the truth. Verse 3 says, "For You have persevered and endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. Over and over, they would teach the truth. They would stand up against liars, against false apostles, against guys who would try to creep up and bring heresy into the church. No, we will stand on the truth. Way to go, Ephesus. And there are still great churches out there that are staying the course and stating the truth, standing on and for righteousness, and still it seems that they enter into the problem of Ephesus. Verse 4, but I have this against you, that you have left your first love. That's a heavy statement for Jesus ever to say, I have this against you. I have a concern for you. You're doing really well. You're lined up with me here, but in this area, we got a problem. If Jesus indicates that in your own life, stop and pay attention. I have this against you. You stayed the course. You stated the truth, but you have strayed from your first love. 
Lots of motion in the church of Ephesus. Just not a whole lot of emotion. Lots of passion about the word. Not a whole lot of passion for people. They had lost. Well, no, they hadn't lost. In fact, if your version says they lost their first love, that's not what it says. You have left your first love. Now, I want you to ponder this for a moment. Think about this. Remember that Ephesus began without the Spirit, that the Spirit was brought by Paul as he taught them and helped them understand, and the Spirit fell on them. At that point, they received the Holy Spirit, but that's not where they began. The Spirit is critical to this issue in a church, and that is the issue of love. You've got to have the Spirit to be a loving church. Why do you say that, Rick? Well, what is the fruit of the Spirit? And you can stop after the first one. What is the fruit of the Spirit? The list begins love. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. But again, the word fruit, karpos in the Greek, is singular. It's singular. And yet, Paul gives a list. The fruit of the Spirit is love. And out of love will flow joy and peace patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and all the other fruits the plurality of fruits come from the singular fruit that is the fruit of love the fruit of the spirit is first and foremost top of the list love love and without the holy spirit a church can at some level be doctrinally sound intolerant of wickedness testing proving persevering but without the spirit without the spirit that church will lack love and love is critical the Spirit is critical to the survival of a church. By the way, it's interesting. The name Ephesus, and you need to write down the names of all these churches as we come to them because they are very telling in the church age, that section of time. Remember, Ephesus is A.D. 30 to about A.D. 100. The beginning, the very first century church, as we call it. The word Ephesus, it's a term of endearment. I like you say sweetheart or honey or lovey. <laughs> Ephesus means darling. Or desirable one. Ephesus, the darling church. The church that Jesus looked at and says, you're my first love. You're the first church. The first century church. The first group of disciples growing out of this love. And we have this love relationship. The very name of the city of Ephesus speaks of romance and tenderness. And here Jesus appeals to the heart of this church and says, don't leave your love. You've left the first love. How many people remember your first love? Maybe it was your puppy love. Maybe you shouldn't raise your hands because your husband or wife will go, I thought it was me. But the first love, that one that you first had eyes for, I remember. I remember vividly. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'll tell you about that in just a minute. Ephesus means darling. And they had not just lost their first love, they had left their first love as in one in a marriage who has moved out. Who has said, this isn't working for me. I'm doing it my way and I'm going to go get an apartment. They had left, walked away from it. In relationships, leaving, and hear me on this, is always a process. Leaving a relationship is always a process. It doesn't begin with just all of a sudden, out of the blue, a husband has an affair. A wife walks out the door. It never, ever happens instantaneously. It's always over time. And a lot of times in a relationship that ends up broken, it's not until after the fact where a person can look back and go, why didn't I see that coming? That's been going on for four years. Five years since the beginning of our marriage, leaving in a relationship is always a process. We humans tend to work ourselves out of love over time. We begin with the little things and it gets bigger and bigger until we have walked away. And the question is, what do you do when you feel like your love is leaving? What do you do spiritually in your Christian life when you feel like you are disconnected from the Lord? When even thoughts of the Lord Jesus just don't bring the thrill to you that they did when you first met him. That, that you don't have those heart palpitations that you did early on. When you used to remember a time when just getting up to be there Sunday morning was the, that you could not wait. And now it's kind of a drudgery to get there. What do you do? Let me warn you. When we've lost the passion for Jesus, we are in process. 
in process of leaving Jesus. Because Jesus should always be a passionate relationship. Does that mean you have to be on a high with Christ all the time? No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm not on a high in my marriage 24-7. That would be wrong. There would be something very, very wrong in my head to not recognize real life. But, but, ask me at any point in my life, am I passionately in love with my wife? And I could say, yes, I am. When I'm away from her, even right now, she's home with Hayden. And when I think of her... <laughs> Jesus gives a practical recommendation when you feel like your love is leaving whether it's a love for a loved one a husband, a wife, a family member or more importantly if it's your love for the Lord what do you do if that love is leaving verse 5 he says therefore remember that's the first thing remember remember those early feelings married couples do you remember your wedding day I do I remember standing up there looking goofy and idiotic, you know, in my tuxedo <laughs> with the tails because it was in at the time. And I remember I can picture Cheryl coming down the aisle. And I'm not going to get all drippy on you here, but I remember. I can feel what I felt. I remember those thoughts. And that's the first thing Jesus says. Man, when, you're, when your relationship is, is getting a little dry, when you're in process of walking away, remember what was it like when you first said, yes, Lord? When you first opened your eyes and, and saw the Lord. And I've heard, I've heard several of your stories. <laughs> One of my favorites is Tracy's. Sitting in church and, and things going on around her. She's going, oh, God still talks to us today? <laughs> wow. And how just, I mean, it's so eye-opening. And think about when you came to the Lord, what happened in your heart? What was that like, Spencer? I mean, you're, you're one of the worst. You're, you're still drippy about the Lord. And it's wonderful. And it's great. Those experiences, God says, hang on to those. You know why we take communion on a weekly basis? It's not just so that we can get this graphic, horrific picture of Jesus on the cross. It's so we remember. This is what he did for me. This is how much he loves me. This is, this is a relationship I am in. I have been blood-bought by one who so passionately loves me. He died before I was even born for me. Remember those early feelings. When did you fall for Jesus? Remember that day. He says, remember from where you have fallen, that first place, your first love. And, he says, number two, repent. Repent and do the deeds you did at first. Remember is, is the first thing in his practical recommendation. The second is return. For that's all repentance is. It's turning around. It's coming back. Return to what you did at first. Turn around. Do what you did when your passion was aroused by the Lord. Well, that's kind of a sensual term to be using in Bible study, Rick. Yeah, but it's accurate, isn't it? That Jesus arouses my passion. Return and repent. Return to what you used to do. Man, I used to read my Bible every night before I went to bed. Do it again. Well, I got up early every Sunday before I even got to church just to prepare my heart. Do it again. Oh, I remember those long prayer walks that I used to take with the Lord. Do it again. Do it again. Remember and return to your first love. And then Jesus gives a caution. He has a warning for those who leave their first love, and that warning is removal. And this is serious. Remember from where you have fallen, he says. Repent. Do the deeds you did at first, or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. Repentance by the world's standards sounds so religious and heavy. Unless you repent, you're going to burn. And so we think, oh, I've got to go through this heavy process of repentance. What Jesus is saying is, I don't want to remove your lampstand, so turn around. Because if you keep walking in that direction, I'll tell you what I'm not going to allow to happen. I'm not going to allow your lampstand to sit there, because you will not be light for the world anymore. How many churches sit dead and still? Don't speak a word of the gospel. Because their lampstand has been taken away. Because they didn't remember their first love. They didn't return. And Jesus, he threatens, he worries, or he warns about removal. Would you flip in your Bibles back to John chapter 15? John chapter 15.
John 15, verse 4. Jesus explains even more potently what he's talking about here, this whole process of remembering and returning and repenting. He says in verse 4, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. In other words, if I don't abide in the Lord, if I don't have His Spirit living in me, forget about the fruit of the Spirit. You're not going to see it. I can't bear fruit without being connected to the Lord. And he says in verse 5, I am the vine, and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away as a branch and dries up, and they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. But if you abide in me and my words abide in you, and I ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove, so prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, and I also have loved you, abide in my love. Is that passionate? If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Here's a process. Here's how you do it. Here's how you remain in my love. Stick to my word. Keep it. And you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. And these things I have spoken to you, so that your joy may be in you, and that your joy, or that my joy, sorry, my joy will be in you, and that your joy may be made full. Again, there's this connection of the fruit, of the fruit of the Spirit. And Jesus says, you want spiritual fruit growing? You want to be producing fruit as a church body, as an individual? You've got to abide in me. You've got to be with me. You cannot be in process of leaving me or having completely left me or having fallen and forgotten your first love. You've got to be with me. But if you are with me, if you abide with me, no question, you will bear fruit. You will. It goes without saying. And it's not because you work so hard. An apple tree doesn't work hard. It just produces apples. It's just what it does. It's natural. Abiding in the ground, watered by the rain, the tree produces the fruit. But when you leave your first love of Jesus behind, that's when you are in danger of ending up left behind. Now, wait a minute, Rick. Are you saying that you can be saved and then lose your salvation? No. I don't believe you can ever lose your salvation. I do, however, however believe you can leave your salvation. That's your call. You can choose to leave it behind. Well, verse 6 going on, Jesus says, Yet this you do have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Who are the Nicolaitans? There was a man named Nicholas, who was no saint, who began a cult in Antioch, which taught... Did you get the no saint comment? That was... Okay. Saint Nicholas, who wasn't a saint. So it was just a little joke, but it went by kind of fast. A man named Nicholas... <laughs> By the way, we're going to talk about Santa Claus in a couple of weeks. We're going to have a great time with that one. Serious. We, uh, three years ago when I, when I taught this before, we got to a certain point as we're studying the churches and some things came up about one of our favorite holidays, Christmas, and I hope to ruin your Christmas like I did for everybody three years ago. <laughs> a man named Nicholas began a cult in Antioch. The Nicolaitans were people of this cult. This cult basically taught and practiced that a person had to indulge in sin to understand it. To get it, to, to know what sin was, and to feel it and sense it, and to be able to see it in your life, you had to act it out. You had to live it out, specifically sexual sins, because the Nicolaitans and Nicholas taught that the spirit and the body were separate. Therefore, physical sins didn't affect the spiritual person. But there's something else that's more important to understand here. That's, that's all bunk what Nicholas taught. Obviously, sin, physical, affects the spiritual. But there's something more interesting, and it's the word Nicolaitan. It's two words. Nico, where we get our word Nike. For Nike shoes, meaning conquest or power. Conquest or power. And Laetans, where we get the word laity, the common people. Nicolaitans, power over the common people. Power over the people. This is what cults are in the business of doing. Gaining power over people. 
If you want to just have a kind of a red flag, a warning sign for whether or not a friend of yours or a family member or maybe even you yourself are being uh, lured toward a cult, it will always be controlling. Always. A cult is controlling. A church that you might show up at and, and would say, hope you can come, you're welcome to be here. It's your call. It's a totally different thing. But a cult is conquest or power over the people. When we started the bridge, I had great advice from a very godly friend who said to me, Rick, if you do nothing else, hold people with an open hand. Hold them with an open hand. Let me tell you something that I have discovered in the last two years that I never knew before as a pastor. And that's if you allow people to be there because they want to be there, they keep coming. But if you tell them they have to be there, that's when they become sporadic. That's when they choose to go somewhere else. Who among us likes to be squeezed? Likes to be controlled? Likes someone coming into their lives and saying, this is how much you have to give and this is how much you have to do and if you're not doing this, you're not really a godly person. Dang, that is the stuff of cults. And yet we see that even in the church today. Your membership, gang, is with the body of Christ. You were made a part of that body the day you believed. You became a member of the church in that day. And no membership to any other body can more strongly confirm that. Because you have the confirmation of the Holy Spirit bringing that. Even Christian groups can become cult-like when they espouse power over the people. I'm your pastor. <laughs> do what I tell you to do. I'll tell you what, if you do what I tell you to do, we're all in serious trouble. Don't do what I tell you to do. You do what the Lord tells you to do, and you do what the Word is telling all of us to do together. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1, a great example of this. Again, Paul. He says, When I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And in and my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom. Although I'll add, they could have been. They could have been. When Paul came to Corinth, he had just come from Athens. Where in Athens, man, he was persuasive in the world's definition of the word. He used philosophy. He got right in where they were and he preached to them with power and with wisdom and with authority. And he preached as one of their philosophers and they laughed him out of Athens. Out of Athens. And so he comes to Corinth, and Paul says, you know, I got to Corinth, and I realized it's not going to be my slick, persuasive words. It's going to be the cross, the message of the cross. He says, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Well, Paul, what do you think about the uh, pervasive uh, thoughts in the world uh, opinion today? About, I, I don't know about that, but I know about Christ and him crucified. I can tell you about my crucified Lord. He goes on and says, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my message and my preaching were just, they weren't persuasive in words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and power. Which must have been really cool because people at Corinth were going, this guy's just not that exciting a teacher. And he keeps just going back to the cross, the cross, the cross, the cross. But look at what's happening here. <laughs> this is incredible. It can't be because of that guy. It must be the Lord. It must be him. And Paul ends 1 Corinthians 2, 5 saying, He did it this way so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Watch out for pastors who are power mongers. You will know them, by the way, by their lack of spiritual fruit. I've told you this before. I'll tell you again. Use the fruit. Look for the fruit. How do I know if someone is walking with the Lord? Are they loving? Are they peaceful, gentle, faithful, good, kind? These are the ways that we tell. Is there fruit hanging off their tree? Is it the spiritual fruit of the Spirit? Ephesus prophetically again represents the apostolic church, A.D. 30 to 100. And I'll tell you, we can learn a lot from the churches of the New Testament. But don't elevate her because our faith is not in the church. It's in the one who is walking in the church. It's in the one who is moving among the lampstands. Well, finally, Jesus finishes it all up. Verse 7. With an eternal motivation, he says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I love this, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Amen. The tree of life, which is in the paradise 
of God. Do you remember the tree of life? It's talked about in Genesis chapter 2, verse 9. Chapter 15, or chapter 2, verses 15 through 18. In fact, let me read to you real quickly something. We're almost there, but dial into this, because it's interesting how this all comes together. Verse 9 of Genesis chapter 2, Out of the ground the Lord God caused to grow every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for the food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And on down in verse 15, Genesis 2 says, The Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, any tree. But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it you will surely die. And you know what happened. But here's the interesting thing. Adam and Eve were given free reign of every fruit, of every tree in the entire garden, which included... The tree of life. Which meant, had they never eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they would have lived forever. Because they would have had the tree of life. And they were allowed to eat from it. They could have been in Eden, <laughs> eating fruit, naked, happy, forever. That could have been eternity for them. And yet, they had to eat of the wrong tree. But the tree of life was theirs for the picking, and God's plan for man was eternal from the very beginning. We need to take heart in that. But as you know, Adam and Eve decided that the sweet fruit wasn't enough for their taste, so they disobeyed God's command. Genesis 3.22 tells us, The Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now he might stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. What's the problem with that? Think about this, gang. If they had sinned, which they had, and sin entered the world with its corruption and its decay, but they continued to eat of the tree of life, they would have continued to live forever in a decayed state. In a corrupted state. I don't want to live in this body. This body is corrupt. I got teeth falling out all over the place. I got hair receding the whole. I mean, I we could go into it. And I've had discussions with many of you saying, you know, specifically, Rick, is this the body that's going to be glorified? <laughs> Am I stuck with this? I got to take this up there with me now? I'll tell you what, if we were all feasting on the tree of life right now, these are the bodies we'd have. Oh, we keep living. We just keep going on. But, but these bodies would continue to decay. Can you imagine after a couple of 300 years? <laughs> I mean, it would take us, we'd have to move church back to like Tuesday just so everybody could get there on time. You know? <laughs> to be in this decay without dying, living forever in a corrupt body. Now we're going to have access to the tree of life again, but this time we will be imperishable, incorruptible, eternal. And as we feast from that tree, which is going to be in the New Jerusalem. Oh, let me read it to you. Revelation 22, verse 1. He showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the middle of its street, on either side of the river, was the tree of life. Blessed are those, verse 14 tells us, who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life. And they enter by the gates of, or the gates into the city. Jesus says to Ephesus, To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. You hold fast to the fruit of love, the fruit of the Spirit, and I will give you the fruit of life that you can eat forever. Hold fast to the fruit of love. Ephesus. That doctrinally sound, persevering church, the kind that didn't shrink back from going to battle against evil, from battling cults, from battling the enemies of Christ and of righteousness. And yet Jesus needed to encourage them, don't cut off your source of fruit. Don't forget your first love. The first century church, for all that it did in those first 60, 70 years that was wonderful, had already in that short amount of time been straying from love. Holding to religion. That's what we do so well as human beings. I, I want to leave you with one last verse. And if you'll flip over there, we'll finish there tonight. Deuteronomy chapter 20. One last thing just to take and chew on and to consider. We've looked at 
These seven churches, in, in a brief overview, they're going to play out for you more as the coming weeks, as we get to them in the coming weeks. But Deuteronomy chapter 20 has an interesting word from the Lord about warfare. We were just talking about spiritual warfare this morning a bit. This falls right into line, and I think it's fascinating. Remember that Ephesus started without the Spirit, had trouble with the first of the spiritual fruit, the fruit of love, and Jesus says, I'll give you fruit. If you'll return to the love, I'll give you the fruit of life. But listen to this. Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 19. God is talking to the people of Israel and he says, Now when you besiege a city a long time to make war against it in order to capture it, you shall not destroy its trees by swinging an axe against them, for you may eat from them, and you shall not cut them down. For is the tree of the field a man that it should be besieged by you? Only the trees which you know are not fruit trees you shall destroy and cut down so that you may construct siege works against the city that is making war with you until it falls. God says, you set up your battlements, you're besieging a city, you're fighting. Don't be stupid. Don't cut off your nose to spite your face. Don't shoot yourself in the foot. Don't cut down the fruit trees all around you to try and prove a point to that other city because you're going to need the fruit while you're fighting. You're going to need the fruit while you're in the battle. What's that got to do with the revelation? Jesus described himself as walking among the lampstands. But not just the lampstand at Ephesus or Smyrna or Pergamum or the assembly or Christ the King or Family Bible or the bridge or New Covenant. Not just those lampstands. Jesus is walking among all the lampstands. For if... The seven churches in Revelation are prophetic, and they are. Then Jesus moving among the lampstands means he is moving among the entire church. So what's this Deuteronomy passage mean? It means let's not cut down the other trees that are bearing fruit for the Lord. Let's not rip the fruit off the branches. Let's not, in our battle, in our desire to, to, to wage war against Satan... To go head to head with the enemies of righteousness. To stand firm. Let's not forget the fruit of our first love. And let's not be about cutting down other church fellowships who are bearing fruit for the Lord. It's so easy to do. Don't cut down or cut off other sources of fruit because we're going to need them as we continue in our battle. Let's pray together. Father, help us to learn from these churches, from these letters. And may we, Father, be like all the best of these seven churches. And may most of all, Father, just thinking ahead, may we never be Laodicea. A church that not only didn't have its first love, had no passion at all. Father, I, I pray that you will again write these words on our hearts and in our minds. And help us as we consider things corporately and historically and prophetically. Tonight, Lord, help us to take these things home personally. To consider where we're at with you, Jesus. If we've walked away, if the fruit of love is lacking in our lives. And help us to return and repent. And to seek again that wonderful fruit of the Spirit that you have provided for the body. Thank you again, Lord, for bringing us through the study. Thank you for the attentiveness of my friends and family here. Bless each of us as we go out of here tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.